Welcome to the Wave Strength. Innovative pension solutions for a secure retirement. Presented by Pacific Life. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Wave Strength podcast. I'm your host, Jim Breen, a marketing director with Pacific Life's institutional division. With us today is a very special guest, Michelle Mace Curran, a former USAF, United States Air Force uh, pilot, uh, also recently the, the lead, so, former lead solo for uh, the Air Force Thunderbirds uh, demonstration team. So uh, first of all, Michelle, thank you for your service. Um, and as we'll talk about, uh, your, your service extends uh, far deeper beyond just the, the, the Thunderbirds um, with the Air Force. Um, so thank you so much for your, your service to the country. Um, but welcome to the show. We are just, we're so excited to have you. I am excited to be here. I'm excited to see what questions you have, and uh, thanks for reaching out and making this happen. Uh, absolutely. And, um, you know, just a, a little bit of a shameless plug here. So we just finished a webinar with our, our, our chief customer experience officer, uh, Christine Tucker. Um, and for, for those of you who would like to go and watch that webinar, you can head over to YouTube and, and search The Wave Strength, uh, and you can see the, the episode where uh, uh, Michelle and Christine talk about um, uh, fin financial preparedness and what it means to set goals. It's a really excellent episode, uh, very motivating uh, uh, to, to listen to, very um, uh, in interesting piece also too in uh, light of Women's uh, History Month. Uh, so glad we put that event on and, and you joining us for that. But, but for this podcast, we really wanted to kind of dive into maybe some of the more de the, the details that we couldn't get to in that, that, um, uh, that, that webinar. Um, and um, so let, let, let's get started here. Um, you know, I, I, I was sharing with you before we got started here that, um, you know, you and I connected in kind of a, a, an interesting way. I took my boys to the Huntington Beach Air Show, which, you know, it is, in my experience, probably one of the coolest air shows I've ever been to because it's like danger close in terms of like how close you are to the ground and, and, and how the, uh, the airplanes can perform um, out over the water and everything. But I took my two boys and then the, the, the following day, we, I started seeing feeds from your channel it could pop up in my Instagram. I'm going, oh, no, wait, that's, I can almost see my kids and I on the sand down there from your canopy camera, your GoPros and your canopy. Yep. And then I started following you. And then fast forward five months, uh, I reached out and said, hey, Michelle, do you ever do speaking engagements? Would you like to come on one of our shows? And, you know, here we are. Here we are. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for, for coming. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a cool, I always appreciate the people that reach out and we're actually there. And especially the ones that, see a video and they're like i literally am in that video you can't see me but i trust me i'm there yeah. um hunting the beach is one of my favorite air shows it's just a beautiful place to fly and the number of people that get to view the air show over the weekend is pretty incredible the numbers uh that come out and i mean there's not really a better place to watch an air show than the beach so so walk me through a little bit michelle let's let's unpack maybe a little a little bit about your background um if i understand correctly you actually didn't even see a airplane uh, or a Thunderbird or an F-16 or any kind of fighter jet until you were actually in the Air Force. Like you never grew up going to air shows or anything like that. Uh, so give us a little history about that. Yeah. So I was not the child that saw the Thunderbirds and was like, mom, I'm going to do that someday. I grew up in northern Wisconsin in a small town, so I just didn't have that exposure. Um, but I realized I need a way to pay for college. That's honestly how it started, which is one of the great benefits that comes with being in the military are the education benefits. And I applied for an Air Force ROTC scholarship and got it, went off to college, uh, but I was a criminal justice major, which I was surprised as people. I think they expect me to be like a aeronautical engineering or something yeah, yeah. Um, because I wanted to work for the FBI. I Maybe I really liked X-Files or something. I don't, I'm not sure what made me want to go <laughs> work for the FBI. Which is all the FBI does. They yes. just investigate UFOs, UFOs allegedly. Fully, yeah. fully accurate uh, <laughs> TV show depiction of the FBI. Um, but yeah, halfway through, I saw my first fighter aircraft actually take off, and it was just a pivotal moment. It was so cool. There were very few times in my life up to that point where I'd experienced just that immediate excitement about something. Yeah. I was like, maybe I should pay attention to that. And I was already doing Air Force ROTC. I was already going to be in the Air Force, so I was in a position to decide to pursue that as a goal. And that moment was kind of the, the pivot to do that. And I just, you know figured out what I need to do to be competitive to get a pilot slot out of college and I did and then I went off to pilot training from there with the whole goal of flying a fighter aircraft at the end of that training course and that ended up happening. And in my limited knowledge of that process, I, I sense a touch of humility in the way that you're describing that. And if I and I might be off base, so 
I, you know, will help our listeners unpack this a, a bit, but many people go in to fly airplanes and in, in, into the Air Force, mm-hmm. but it, you can't just cherry pick. You say, you know, I want to be in that plane because there are many other planes that are in the uh, umbrella of the Air Force, right? Like uh, uh, um, the cargo planes, the yep. C-17s and such, or, or even just uh, transport planes. Um, and so it's not that you can cherry pick, right? That this is something that because of your abilities, am, am I uh, understanding this correctly, or maybe uh, your aptitude or something that, that allows you to go to that higher echelon of planes? Yeah, so about halfway, pilot training itself is, the actual flying portion is about a year long. And everyone starts in the same trainer aircraft together. It's called the T-6. It's got a prop out front. It mm-hmm. can pull about 6 Gs, flies around 300 knots. It's a fun airplane to fly. Um, everyone six, starts- 6 Gs. So, yeah. okay, I heard you G-force. say this. So, G-4. So, on Earth, we're all traveling at 1 G. Yes. Yeah, so, which- it's our normal weight, 1 G. So, whatever you weigh on the scale, that's, you know, what you are under 1 G. But then each number you go up, so 2 Gs, 3 Gs, that's multiplying that. So, 6 Gs would be 6 times your body weight. Uh, the F-16 pulls up to 9 Gs. Um, the T6 that you learn in pulls up to six. So it's a gradual step up to a high performance aircraft. But um, my class was 25 students. We all went through T6s. And then about halfway through six months in, the class splits into a couple different tracks. And you have the heavy aircraft track, so cargo, tankers, that kind of thing. They go fly a T1, which is kind of like a little Learjet looking aircraft. Um, and then everyone else that's going to the fighter bomber track. So that makes you eligible to eventually fly fighter aircraft, bomber aircraft goes into another aircraft, the T-38. Um, you have to at least be in the top 50% of your class, so the top half to go in the fighter bomber track. And then they only have in my class, I believe we had six people. They had six spots open. So like who in the class, you know, raise your hand if you're interested in the fighter bomber track. However many people are like, yes, I am. They're like, okay, this portion isn't even in the top half of the class, so you're already not going to do that. And then of the people that want that, we have six spots. And so they basically rank you in the top six people that are interested now going to that track. So that's the first divide in the road. Then once you're there, now you're competing against those six people. And the aircraft that are available is all based on the needs of the Air Force. So it depends on manning and the specific units, the specific airframes. At the end of the course, you fill out what's called a dream sheet, which lists your aircraft preferences. Um, I put the F-16 first. I put the A-10 second. And I actually went back and forth for a long time about which one I wanted to put first. The A-10 is a pretty cool airplane as well. Yes. Okay. They do a cool mission with close air support. They have a really big gun. It's, it's cool. And the one that has that big, like, oh, yeah, noise exactly. when it does exactly. the, 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 shoots the gun. That yeah, was yeah. a perfect... <laughs> That was a pretty good interpretation, wasn't it? It was good. good. Uh, So I went back and forth because cool mission, but then I kind of remembered the thing that drew me to want to go into flying was seeing a fighter jet take off of the laughter burner, Mm -hmm. and the F-16 has has that ability. So I put F-16s first. Um, And historically, around the time I was graduating, classes were getting anywhere between one to four fighter aircraft available. So it was very important that I did well in those six people. Like, Every check ride, every flight, I knew it was kind of make or break for my ranking. Mm -hmm. And the guy that ended up being first out of that group of six, he had done consistently very well. And so we all kind of knew he would be ranked first. Um, So it was kind of a fight for the second spot. And it was me and one other person were neck and neck the entire time. And then after like our last check ride, um, I just did a little bit better than he did on that one flight. And I knew that shifted it. So I knew I was in second. And my class ended up getting two fighter aircraft. Oh, cool. So it oh, great. it really came down to that one flight that allowed me to secure that second place spot, if you want to call it that. And I was able to get the F-16. They had one available. And that must have yeah. been such a, uh, just a, uh, a, a, not just relief, but a, a moment of excitement and, and Absolutely. you know, accomplishment, frankly. Yeah, I I remember bits and pieces of it. I partially think I blacked out when they announced <laughs> what my aircraft was. Yeah, after yes, you were yes. not blank. Okay, good. Yes, at the, the <laughs> night uh, drop night where we find out our assignments because it was so just emotionally overwhelming because it was so exciting. Um, but afterwards, I was just like, what just happened? These opportunities that you have in your life, these achievements and the goal setting, um, the, you, you have a pretty focused, uh, sounds like a pretty focused vision of what you want. Yeah, I think once I decide I want something, I... I logically lay it out. That doesn't mean I don't, you know, have stumbles along the way or doubt myself along the way and deal with all of that. But 
I think I'm able to look at it kind of analytically and be like, this is the formula for success for this objective. And then just start ticking those things off, um, which tends to work pretty well. Um, Have you so, always been like that? I think so. I, I did really well academically growing up. And I think it was kind of that same mentality. It was like, okay, I have a science test coming up. Here are the chapters I need to study. Make the note cards, study the words, whatever, and do well on the test. Um, and it just, it worked really well. Um, when I got to my first assignment, I struggled a little bit though, because that had always worked for me. And all of a sudden I was in this environment that was just so much more difficult than any environment I had been in. And mm -hmm. even though I felt like I was studying and I was spending, you know, every night until I was falling asleep on the couch studying and then all weekend, I still felt behind all the time. Um, and so it was probably the first time in my life where I had a little bit of a hit to confidence in my own abilities and that came as a little bit of a shock so there was that voice of self-doubt at that point i was just like oh you're in over your head look look what you did let me ask you this question michelle so obviously a lot of uh experience overcoming uh adversity and uh just even in your own mind goal setting uh, you mentioned that that's something you know that goal setting has been a part of maybe your your being the fabric of your, your being your entire life but somebody that is trying to get to that point or maybe feels that they are a procrastinator or they have not had that in their life what what maybe uh, uh you know ingredient or a suggestion could you provide to somebody that that is trying to get to where you are from in, in that mental state of being able to prepare goal set and, and achieve your dreams yeah i think it can seem really overwhelming to the point where people just don't know where to even start or the idea of all the things that have to align and all the work that has to be done to get to the end objective is just like, wow, that sounds like just too much. Um, but really is a couple steps, like figure out what that end objective is. You have to know where you're going first. So for me, it was kind of clearly laid out with, I want to be a fire pilot. That's a very like distinct measurable objective. Um, but it, they're not always that clear. So figure out what it is. And then, I just did the research of the steps that needed to happen and looking at that as a whole, people reach out to me on social media all the time and they're, you know, they aren't in the military at all. They don't have any flying experience and they're like, tell me how to become a Thunderbird. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, we got to take a few steps back yeah, here. Back it up a little bit. Like that's all, there's a lot to unpack. There's a lot that has to happen. There's a lot that has to align. Um, but the people that reach out to me and they're like, Hey, you know, I've been interested in aviation. I'm working towards my private pilot's license. I'm looking at options in the military. I'd love to fly a fighter aircraft one day. Do you have any advice? Like those are so much easier to to mentor because they've already done a little bit of research on kind of the roadmap. Um, they're not just asking someone else to provide that for them because I'm happy to help provide advice, but it's it's tough when someone comes in with zero knowledge. Um, so, you know, doing that little bit of research and then it's really just one bite at a time. I know there's that saying about how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time or whatever it is, but it is the closest alligator to the boat is the analogy that they always use in flight training because it feels like there's so much information to learn. It's overwhelming. It's easy to find yourself drowning in that. And once you get into that mindset of feeling overwhelmed and then procrastinating, it just starts to get worse. It just turns into a revolving cycle of the more overwhelmed you get, the more you procrastinate, which just makes the problem worse. Um, so if you can just tackle the alligator closest to the boat, and kind of compartmentalize, focus on that, and not worry about all that other stuff. That's that's just how you one step at a time. It sounds cliche. But no, it's it's, it's true. It's, it's so it's, true. It's true, and and it's you know it's not you know my growing up um, being from a big family. You know you'd hear sometimes it's not about the the sprint, it's about the marathon. You know taking it one step at a time, and also to you know how do you eat that elephant? You know one bite at a time, yeah. and I think that that has a lot of truth to it and obviously looking at your life and things that you've done in your career um you you've put that uh into practice and you've achieved some pretty significant goals um you know out of curiosity too this is just a, a question so um i know the space shuttle program is no no more but how many uh, uh thunderbird alumni were there any alumni from the thunderbirds that went on to fly the space shuttle out of curiosity i mean was that like a track to go to space uh, I'm not sure if there's any Thunderbird alumni. I don't think so. But interestingly enough, the next um, SpaceX yeah. mission 
one of like the mission commander or not the mission commander like the lead pilot for that is a former thunderbird oh really yeah oh no way okay. yeah so that's super cool so on the private side um as far as nasa astronauts so a ton of them are former fighter pilots that's a common track that goes in uh a lot of people are like are you gonna apply to be an astronaut and while i would love to go to space there's a lot more requirements than just being a fighter pilot um you know i think the people that they're sending have to be very uh multi-talented as far as you're a fighter pilot and you're a doctor <laughs> oh, or like okay, okay, I see you know, they have multiple okay, uses other yeah. than just because flying I, the, don't get the me wrong aircraft. i'd say that you have a significant talent uh, palette already but i see what you're saying but very yeah, specific yeah. to that <laughs> right okay, okay, so okay. um you'll the if you ever look at the actual nasa astronaut um resumes of the people that get selected wow talk yeah. about some incredible people someone that was like a special operator flies helicopters now flies jets and also went to med school and is a surgeon you're like how how are you how did you have time to do all that um so basically so yeah. what you're saying is i will never go to space is what, what basically what you're probably i won't either you never know the private sector <laughs> the though private sector, it's right? opening up yeah, yeah it's really not? cool it opens the possibility i mean they need they, they need an an, an average looking podcast host in space right it, Don't they, yeah they, podcast they, from yeah. space would be cool <laughs> yeah uh, elon musk if you're listening okay <laughs> Uh, no, but, uh, that, you know, that's interesting. I, I, that, that popped into my head and, um, and it really is just such a watching the Thunderbirds as a kid who grew up going to, you know, Miramar or El Toro or Huntington Beach and watching the Blue Angels or the Thunderbirds or, um, you know, the stealth team or the, 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 the Raptor presentation team and all these amazing, um, just living, pushing the envelope mm -hmm. folks. Um, you mentioned er earlier, you know, when you're flying in that formation. And I think you use a, a an analogy of like an alligator. What is it? The alligator an analogy I that you're using for when it seems overwhelming, the amount of stuff you have to deal with, the number of tasks you have to take on. You just you prioritize them. You just have to deal with the closest alligator to the boat. So it's kind of like a game of whack a mole. Yeah, yeah. Where like whichever one is popping up, whichever <laughs> one is the closest threat, the thing that has to be dealt with right now. And that's actually something you learn way back in pilot training. And it's definitely something that takes repetition and training is prioritizing the tasks. Um, so we always talk about emergency procedures and if mechanical malfunctions happen in the aircraft, you know, if you're the person that's worrying about making an emergency radio call, not dealing with actually flying the aircraft, you're probably misprioritizing. Like step one, just fly the aircraft and then you can deal with everything else. And it's so easy to get those out of order. People will fixate on one thing and forget about the most important thing of actually flying the jet, making sure it doesn't hit the ground. Okay, so when you're flying in formation like that, I mean, how close are those jets? I know from the ground it looks like the wings are almost touching, but uh, is it inches? Is it feet? Help our, our listeners understand how how close are you doing those loops together and in, 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 in formation when you're in formation? Yeah. So. I was in kind of a unique position as a solo pilot. So I did fly in close formation when we would all six come together and we would be as close as three feet um, in that formation. And then the diamond pilots, which is numbers one through four, they're the four jets that stay in formation for most of the demonstration. They get as close as 18 inches to each other, which yeah. Inches. And they're going about 400 knots most of the time. So that's you know, well over 400 miles an hour, closer to 500 miles an hour. 18 inches. I yeah. mean, even mm -hmm. on the freeway going 60 miles an hour, if well, you're 18 inches to a car, you go, hey, buddy, you're too close to me. Right. I mean, that's that's wild. That's where the trust comes in, right? That person on the freeway, I have no idea what they're going to do. But the jet next to me, I know exactly what they're going to do because we've done it hundreds of times. And the trust between us is just incredible. Are there exercises, um, without going into specifics and revealing anything that is going to get me killed, but uh, it, are there any trade secrets or anything you do as a team to gain that trust, right? Because you're only with each other in the Thunderbirds team, right? Av uh, typically two years, but I know with the pandemic, you ended up three years right. on the team. But in that short time, what do you do to, to gain that, that high level of trust? Honestly, training season, um, which is when we're not doing air shows. So when the team is at home at, in Las Vegas from November to about March, they just actually had their first air show this past weekend, the current team. Um, that time is, it's a lot. You're flying anywhere from seven to 10 times a week. And just that repetition and the stress of learning a new skill and slowly getting better at it, I really just brings you together as a team. Um, so that, and then, you know, when, we're on, when we were on the road, 
uh, we would do a lot of stuff to build relationships and morale. We would, you know, go run together. We would go for coffee at local places. We would go out to dinner together. We would try to experience the local city that we were in with a limited amount of time we had outside of the actual air show. Um, so not only are they your coworkers and people flying next to you, but they become your friends too. It's your, you're gone 200 days plus a year. Oh, wow. So okay. you see those people more than you see your family. Okay. So there's plenty of opportunity to really g grow that, that level of trust. And plus everybody understands, I'm sure, um, that high level, the, the importance of safety and the, the high level of the, the risks and all those things take it. And plus you have your training as an, uh, w with the air force to fall back on, right. That, 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 um, to that point, because you flew and, and, and maybe this is a, a bit of a segue here, but you also flew those fighter missions, uh, pr prior to, um, the Thunderbirds as well in Af Afghanistan, correct? Right. So you, you can't even apply to be a Thunderbird unless you have 750 hours of flight time in a fighter aircraft already, which that doesn't mean much like what, how long does that take? Um, so that took me five to six years of flying the F-16 to get to the numbers required to even apply to the team. So you already have to be an experienced pilot. That's a prerequisite because the flying is so precise and demanding on the team. They need that experience level to even apply. Crazy question. What's the fastest you've ever flown? Uh, over the Mach, so over the speed of sound um, by quite a bit. I'd have to, oh, probably faster than that, probably like 800 miles an hour if you're talking not knots but miles an hour. The jet can go Mach 2, which is twice the speed of sound, so it can go over 1,500 miles an hour. For, for how long? Like, if you had a full tank of gas, I mean, it's a very... stupid question. Like, if you just filled up at Shell, like, yeah. how far, like how how fast or how long could you go at in Mach 2? I mean, oh, in full AB, you're burning gas so fast that you could only hang out there for like a handful of minutes. Oh, handful. Okay. So it's, you never go that fast because there's not a reason to. It's, it's I've balancing. I've seen too many movies. I know. Yeah, right? I've seen too many movies. It's <laughs> balancing the need for. The, the need for speed the need for speed. <laughs> just, you have the need yeah it's balancing the need for speed <laughs> with the need to stay airborne long long enough you know yeah. to complete your mission okay. so you rarely will just light the afterburner and go as fast as possible because there's no tactical reason to do that other than it's it's cool i guess to be able to <laughs> land and say i went you know a thousand miles an hour um but yeah the jet is very capable it's more of fuel limitation and could you share with us um Maybe in your entire career in the Air Force, maybe the most exhilarating in-air experience that you had, whether it was combat missions or, or with the Thunderbirds. I mean, what was something that you will forever look back on as that was cool? That was that was a killer memory. Well, there's a lot. Um, some of I don't know if exhilarating is the right word. Some of the views that I've seen from the cockpit, I realized the how lucky I am in that moment that very few people will see that perspective from that um from that view even you know flying commercially you get some pretty cool views but that bubble canopy of all glass and the ability to fly over uh like Yosemite or the ability to fly when I was stationed in Japan um there were some little volcan volcanic islands off the coast and we would fly low level next to the snowy perfect cylinder volcano no one else is out there it's uninhabited you know no one else is seeing those things you're like looking into the top of a volcano obviously it's not active but just the views you would <laughs> sure. see moments like that i'd be like this is crazy i'm trying to take a snapshot in my mind and file this away for when i'm 80 years old to look back on um but that's when i was those are my favorite moments honestly it's not the the crazy high g you're flying upside down um or flying super fast. It's those kind of like serene, surreal moments. And I want to encourage you to go to Michelle's Instagram, which is at Mace Curran, mm -hmm. and check out some of these videos. And you'll get a, a very uh, specific sense of what she's talking about with the 360 views from the GoPros that she was able to place in the, in the cockpit, where you see truly that 360 degree view. And uh, I can see what you mean because, you know, those of us who've only flown commercially, you, you have that very limited view. Absolutely. Um, and so that that's pretty interesting. What 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 is the most? Um, can you share with us maybe the the most fearful or or um, uh, um, maybe not fearful, but the 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 hardest moment? Uh, you know, in in your body of of flight with the uh, the Air Force, the scariest moment perhaps. Yeah. So when you're a new pilot, there's all kinds of hard moments because you're always 
we call it behind the aircraft like your brain is just behind processing stuff so you're constantly um another analogy we use is a helmet fire like people if it was possible would see smoke coming out of your ears because your brain's <laughs> working so hard um so i have plenty of those which felt like very difficult moments because you're just overwhelmed um i hit a really big bird when we were flying an air show in columbia uh like columbia the country so i was um oh behind the show line out over the rainforest the jungle of oh columbia and at a couple thousand feet and i hit a vulture so those things are like it was a six huge. foot wingspan yeah, it was huge i saw it but there's nothing i could do because it was just a black spot and i was going you know 500 knots almost oh, so man. it was just a black spot and then it got large very quickly and i heard and felt it hit the aircraft um so that those kind of things that happen completely unexpected definitely gets the adrenaline going for a few minutes and gets your heart rate up but then you literally just take a deep breath and pause for a second. The aircraft is not falling out of the sky. I don't have warnings going off. My canopy's not missing. Like <laughs> everything's okay. Right. I checked the wow. engine instruments because okay. I it went underneath my nose, which is where the intake is for the engine. So I didn't know if it had gone down the engine. Everything's fine. And then I just, you know, made a radio call, let them know what happened, and I set up to land. And the jet landed fine, but there were two. Uh, fist size holes punched through the side of the intake through the metal from that bird and it did partially go down the intake um, but luckily most of it spun around and went outside the the bulk of it so that's amazing that's yeah I, was, th- th- thankfully you obviously were unscathed and if that bird what were millimeters higher it could have hit the canopy and created a problem yeah so kind of the two worst case scenarios would be the canopy um although the canopies are surprisingly strong if you go on youtube there's actually videos of them um testing the canopy with like a frozen turkey like they shoot it it sounds funny but because you're no bird is ever as heavy as a frozen turkey right i guess that's true yeah those things would be pretty heavy of course so they'll shoot it at the canopy and They'll do it enough where it'll like actually break, but you can see how much force it'll take. It'll actually flex, flex to the point where the heads up display, which is like the glass right here where all of our information is, it'll flex to the point where it actually hit that, shattered that, and then bounced back out and the canopy stayed intact. Oh my gosh. So it's pretty incredible. Even that bird might not have gone through the canopy at that airspeed and that size. Um, but you know, you're like, but what if it had? What if it had? Um, and then the other one is the engine, of course. The F 16 only has one engine. Oh, oh, so I mean, the fan blades in there can take quite a bit. I've lots of people have hit smaller birds or like had small rocks go in their intakes right. while they're taxiing or whatever it is, and the engine does fine. But that was as far as birds go on the large end for sure. So who knows what would have happened? Um, they did find feathers in there afterwards, but again, I think it was just like a wing that went down there. Oh, yes. So the the bulk of the bird went through the outside, but to see the damage to the aircraft, like the metal of the jet was just punched out there were two fist size holes was pretty impressive to know that a bird did that so if our listeners are ever in columbia and you see a one winged vulture <laughs> flying around you know who took the wing yeah <laughs> yeah tell what him, happened to the other wing <laughs> tell them to stay out of the airspace yeah, tell them to stay clear of the thunderbird <laughs> um but uh you know we're real appreciative again and 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 thank you michelle so if somebody wants to reach out to you or connect with you or get on your socials or anything like that how can they connect with you yeah, so Instagram is the best way. I do read all the messages that I get there. So it's just Mace underscore Kern, um, like my call sign and my last name. Um, that's probably the best option, honestly. I'm mm-hmm. also on LinkedIn, just my first and last name. So that's another option as well. Tell us about Upside Down Dreams real quick. What, what are you doing with that? Yeah, so I, I left active duty um, and, you know, there's just a lot of other passions I wanted to pursue. So I decided it was time to do that. And kind of like I mentioned, the most rewarding part of the job was being able to inspire people and influence them in a positive way. And Mm -hmm. so I was kind of trying to figure out how to continue to do that. And so I launched my own company, Upside Down Dreams, a little bit of play on, you know, being number five and being inverted a lot of the time. (laughs) And I'm going out and speaking. So keynote speaking. Mm -hmm. um, I've talked to schools, every everyone from the little kids. I did a science class on G-forces. I talked about teamwork. Um, but then I have my you know longer format kind of traditional keynote that I've given to like CEOs of companies or conventions. And that's really about my own story of kind of struggling with self-doubt and mm-hmm. imposter syndrome and a mindset shift that I was able to go through that ultimately led me to being in the role that I'm kind of known for at this point. Um, it wasn't just a smooth, a smooth path where I always knew what I should do and never doubted myself. So I think people appreciate the vulnerability 
um and it kind of makes them realize that i don't have some magical thing that they don't have and Mm -hmm. so that it opens up possibilities in their mind for what they can achieve and it's just so cool to be able to do that for people yeah michelle i mean uh this is i mean we could probably talk at least i could i have like a million other questions but i know we're we're limited uh, on time and um we're just so grateful for you spending time with us uh, again, thank you also for joining uh, Christine earlier for that webinar. Again, which I, I I really encourage our listeners head over to YouTube, search for that that uh, that webinar video that you can watch with uh, Michelle and Christine Tucker, our Chief Customer Experience Officer. Um, and you know, Michelle, again, thanks for your service, all that you do. Um, you inspire so many people, especially these young women that are at that air show and they watch the pilots getting out and they see you, you know, whip your braid, you know, in that, those cool videos where you're whipping your braid as you, as you go and you fly and they go, that's, that's, she's like me. That's Mm -hmm. like me. And so, um, how how does that, let me ask you that though. How does that make you feel? Like, I mean, that has to give you some, a sense of pride. Absolutely. That was the coolest part of the job. The flying was the most fun flying I did in my career, but it wasn't the most rewarding part, Mm -hmm. the physical Mm -hmm. flying. It was the engagement with people and seeing the inspiration in their faces Mm -hmm. that's Mm -hmm. just such a unique position to be in to have a platform to be able to impact people like that and it was just so rewarding michelle thank you for spending time with us today uh it's just been such an exciting opportunity to to connect with you and learn more about your background and what you're doing uh best of luck to you with upside down dreams and everything you're doing in the future Uh, and to our listeners thank you for joining us on another exciting episode of the wave strength podcast i want to encourage you to please like and subscribe to stay current with our content and have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. This has been another episode of The Wave Strength presented by Pacific Life. Don't forget to catch us on YouTube and make sure to subscribe. Although this podcast is presented by Pacific Life, the opinions and views expressed are those of the hosts and participants and do not necessarily reflect Pacific Life's views on any of the topics discussed. Pacific Life is a product provider. It is not a fiduciary and therefore does not give advice or make recommendations regarding insurance or investment products. Pacific Life, its affiliates, its distributors, and respective representatives do not provide any employer-sponsored qualified plan administrative services or impartial advice about investments and do not act in a fiduciary capacity for any plan. Pacific Life refers to Pacific Life Insurance Company, Newport Beach, California, and its affiliates, including Pacific Life and Annuity Company. Insurance products are issued by Pacific Life Insurance Company in all states except New York and in all states by Pacific Life and Annuity Company. Product availability and features may vary by state. Each insurance company is solely responsible for the financial obligations accruing under the products it issues. This podcast was recorded on March 29th, 2022.